you feel like you have unlived life in you, don't stop. Don't let that just simmer. Every day that goes by is a day that you don't get back. Well, hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast with me, Samuel Harris, where we discuss the psychology of self-improvement. And today we have the insatiable Heather Thorkelson on the podcast to discuss how to build a life that you really do love and do the things that you've dreamed of. Heather has lived in the Arctic Circle and she runs one of the fastest growing Antarctic exploration companies out there. Heather is a certified life coach and author of the book No Plan B, which is a masterclass on helping people who are unhappy with the 9 to 5 work out ways to unleash their potential. In this conversation, Heather really helps demonstrate the mindsets and approaches that you need to make the most of what is our very short time on earth and to just grab life by the balls and seize the moment. I love her unique perspective on how to build an authentic life and this conversation is truly just a testament to resilience, adventure and the human spirit. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. We jump into the conversation on the topic of the mistakes that people make about coaching and how to coach yourself. Enjoy. The thing about life coaching that I think people don't understand is that it has really nothing to do with advice and it has everything to do with asking the right questions. I think that doing some kind of even just a short course to dip your toes in without doing any serious year long program like I did, which was a huge investment. Um, Just doing a short course in it is so valuable because you start to see that there are ways of helping people and interacting with people that are so powerful and they're so much easier than you think if you know how to ask the right questions and not just the right questions, but how to approach these scenarios. So I found the life coaching program I did just incredibly valuable in that respect. And of course, it plays into my work because I work with entrepreneurs. I work with people who live in a constant state of uncertainty, dealing with all kinds of internal dialogue about themselves and about their work and about their value in the world and all this kind of stuff. And so I think everyone should take life coach training. <laughs> Do you think everyone that you've coached, you'd have recommended that to? Because I mean, when I did my Vipassana, I was like, everyone should do a Vipassana, but then I'm not sure if it is actually right for some people. And But then yeah. life coaching, I guess, is it like cause you, you're more interested at a math level about things? I should correct myself and say anyone who's interested in any degree of self-reflection then Mm. yeah go for it if you're really not interested in that kind of stuff or if you're like a full-blown narcissist you can take a pass it would really help most people to get into self-reflection but maybe they might need to do some other things first to call to that interest to improve themselves to then go and do that i think that people think that you know you do a life coaching program or a course or a certification or whatever in order to like as a means to an end, like I'm going to take this, I'm going to study this so that I can then do it in a professional capacity. And I think that's where some people have it wrong. You can learn about life coaching to help yourself, similar to how you'd go to a Vipassana or like silent retreat or whatever. You can do this to help yourself or a yoga training certification program. You might not be a yoga teacher afterwards, but like you helped yourself Mm. incredibly. Definitely. This is my problem though is I keep on doing things just for my own interest of them because I can actually go and do it. I'm like, yeah, the whole process of doing the whole thing afterwards is a bit much. Okay. So yeah, you moved to Peru and did things. And then, so how did you then transition from like just doing online coaching to coaching businesses and then running like actual events and stuff? Cause that seems like quite a big jump. Well, Sam, I just take the jump. I'm, the kind of person that if I get an idea and I think it'll be really cool, I think, okay, well, why not? Like, what's the worst that can happen? You know? So when I put up the sales page for my first retreat for entrepreneurs, I was living in Peru and I was going to fly back north to Iceland, which is like super, you know, the wrong yeah, right. direction to go. But I'm half Icelandic and I love Iceland and Iceland was starting to, well, it had been really popular for a couple of years. So I knew that people would want to come partially because they wanted to go to Iceland. I had kind of a unique selling proposition in that I know it well. I have family there. I can take you like on the insiders thing. We're going to stay in a little town outside of the capital and like have a really great entrepreneurial like mastermind experience. Yeah, I put up the ad for it. I mean, it was pretty low cost too. I think I just broke even, but four people immediately signed up. It was like within 48 hours. And I thought, okay, well that worked. (laughs) 
And then the next year, because I was living in Peru at that time, I thought, well, why am I going so far? I may as well bring people to my backyard because Peru is amazing. And again, you know, people were interested because they'd been following me online. I was blogging every week. I blogged every week for six years. So I had quite a big, you know, readership for that. And when I said, look, I'm living in Peru, we're going to go up to the Sacred Valley. I found this amazing place that we're going to stay. That's not where all the tourists go. We're going to go to like the untourist opposite end of the Sacred Valley. And I'm going to show you some amazing stuff and we're going to get out of our comfort zone and blah, blah, blah. So like it wasn't. It wasn't just that I was like life coach, business coach, big events. It was sort of like I had cultivated the audience that was following my adventurous life already. And when I was like, come with me on an adventure and we're going to do some business stuff, they were like, yeah. <laughs> you alluded to blogging every week. That's also an interesting thing. Is that like a, just a general habit of life or was there an agenda behind it? Did you just do your thoughts? Or what was the blogs about? That's what everybody was doing at the time. I mean, I started my business in 2011. Everybody was like, you got to have a blog and you got to have multiple opt-ins and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, I'll start writing then. It wasn't just journaling. I had a lot of really specific things that I wanted to talk about, about, yeah, taking chances and like resetting your relationship with risk and all this kind of stuff. I have a lot of really, really weird stories from my super weird upbringing, having lived all over the world. And so I was always weaving some strange <laughs> into a bigger picture that brought it back to like, how do we show up in our businesses? A lot of the kind of psychological stuff and I suppose like inspirational, motivational kind of stuff. And yeah, I don't know, people just really liked it. The blogging every week was really hard for me because writing is hard. I was an okay writer at the time. I'm a better writer now because obviously if you blog every week for six years, you improve, but it doesn't just come naturally. Yeah, it wasn't easy. It didn't come naturally to me. But I was like, this is what I do. This is how I market myself as a coach. I write and I put my writing out there. People find me, they connect with me, they hire me. So I was really, really consistent with it, including when I went to Antarctica. I had a virtual assistant and I would like send at like midnight when the like satellite connection was free because it was pretty much the only time I could get onto the internet. At midnight on a ship in Antarctica, I'd like send off my blog post the night before it was going to be published to my virtual assistant who had then put it up on my website. So yeah, I was pretty, pretty consistent with it for six years. And then I stopped. That's super cool. Ed. I certainly agree that writing is very hard, but can we go back to, you said you used to weave in your stories. I quite like that in my own writing. I kind of find that I've got lots of silly kind of fun stories that relate to like meta principles in life. And it's certainly part of my writing style. But do you have any stories that you could give an example of that worked really well in your blogs, like one of your favorite blogs like took off? Yeah, I think the one that I wrote really early on, like in the first year of writing, that made quite a splash, including like someone who I have huge respect for. I think she's an absolutely amazing writer. And she wrote me and was like, this blog post blew my mind. And I, it was, for me, it was like having Oprah send me an email and being like, I love you. I was just like, huh, what? Like, it was amazing to me. And it was a blog post about basically how I had had pretty severe social anxiety my whole young life. And I told you before that I went to university for two years and then I dropped out. And the reason that I dropped out, aside from just that I wasn't happy in my school and I was super depressed. Like I'd gone to high school in Costa Rica and then I'd come back for university in Canada and I just had really bad reverse culture shock and I had really bad anxiety and I was in a dark, dark place for two years. And so then I was like, okay, I hate myself right now. I hate my life. I'm constantly hiding from everything. I don't have any friends. I don't fit in Canada anymore. I'm super social. I'm an introvert, but I need to be around people. So we all need friends, right? And I was really suffering and I thought, okay, how can I blow everything up. Like, how can I completely change my reality? I'm tired of myself. I'm tired of my own terror about life and about being out in the world, you know? And so I thought, okay, how do I get over this? And I thought, okay, well, exposure therapy. Why don't I just throw myself into the fire? I'm going to go to one of the busiest, most peopley places that I can think about. I'm going to go somewhere where like, they don't, most people don't speak English, at least they didn't back then. It was 1998. But, but you know, just go where I'm going to be in a constant state of discomfort and see if I can survive. So I did. I dropped out of university. I went and lived in my sister's basement for three months over summer and worked a really crappy job stocking shelves from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. every morning. 
saved up, I think, about $3,000. And then I flew to Japan, backpack, three grand, and no job, no place to live. I literally remember in the blog post, I write about this, that I like came up from the subway after having left the airport, took the subway down to some hostel that I was planning on staying at. And I don't know if you've ever been to Japan or any listeners have been to Japan, but like when you come up out of the subway in Tokyo, nothing makes sense. It's just like there's a bazillion people everywhere. There's a million signs. You have no idea where you're going. You don't know. You can't read the signs, you know, and like my hostel was on the 18th floor of an office building. So I didn't even know how to find the office building. And so I remember standing there on the corner, the street corner in Japan and just being like, I'm going to barf. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm going to die. Like, uh, uh, I was so par- I was just standing there, like absolutely paralyzed. And I was 19, I think, at the time. Actually, I'm, I'm, I can feel it in my stomach right now, reliving that moment. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and then I just started figuring things out. Like I faced my fears. That day and every day after, I, I was in a constant state of terror for like the next year. And it completely changed my life. You know, like it completely changed who I was because I suddenly realized that like, I will always be fine. I will always find the answer. I will always get by. I will. And not only that, but like I made some amazing friends. I got a Japanese family who I still to this day adore and I'm in really good contact with. There was so much beauty that came out of that. That's a really cool story. Thanks. I have been to Japan and yes, it's mental and <laughs> crazy. And yeah, it's, it's something you kind of learn from traveling. It's like things can go completely wrong, but like it ends up fine and yeah. so useful. But I do kind of worry that like these days it is much easier to travel. Like you've got like Google Translate and you can always see where you're going on the map, but you don't have to ask people for directions and all these things that used to go wrong, you're not so used to dealing with. So when things go like more wrong, it's, it's like yeah. more hard. Whereas yeah. you know, your phone does so much for you these days. It's always there to help you with like the problems that you have. I feel really fortunate that I grew up in that time where we didn't have those things. Like that was right mm. on the cusp, you know, like the internet yeah, yeah. was just starting to become a thing and we didn't have smartphones or anything like that. And so like I had to read maps. I had to ask for directions on the street corner, all that kind of stuff, you know. And I'm really, really glad in a way that it was like that because I lived through a time that nobody now in the future will ever know. You know, like we, I went, I got, I had a Japanese boyfriend, um, that I met while I was living there, obviously. And then we went traveling together afterwards. And we took this like Chinese working ship from a port in Japan over to China. So we were the only non-Chinese people on it. We couldn't communicate at all. (laughs) And like, we didn't even know what they were serving in the cafeteria. We were just like guessing at the food. It was all super weird. And we were sleeping on the floor because that's how they did it on the Chinese working ship. And then we got to China. There was no internet. Some places had dial up, but it mostly didn't work. And we didn't take a guidebook with us. So we spent a month in China, mostly totally confused. Mm. <laughs> and like, that would never happen now, you know? I remember I did a, took a gap here when I was 19. I drove across America, but without like a sat nav or anything. And I had a compass on my dashboard. And I went down like the West Coast. And it was only when I started going east that I realized my compass was just pointed south the whole time. I didn't even know where it was going. <laughs> and then just like... I got lost so many times. I tried to find an organic farm once and I had to knock on people's doors and things. They ended up in this really like dodgy area on the border with Mexico. Oh my God. And this one like group of people that were clearly drug dealers were actually really nice. And they were like, they're quite concerned for my safety. And they were like, you're never going to find this like stupid farm thing. Just stay with us for the night. So I ended up staying the night with some Mexican drug dealers because I didn't have a phone or a sat nav on me. And I had a really nice time and made friends. And I'm still friends with them on Facebook. It's like, that would never happen now. And yeah. you're like, yeah, you think... I mean, maybe it's like a safer thing in general, but like most people aren't as bad as you think, I guess. And then I guess that leads directly into how did you set up a polio expedition company? That's pretty cool. Yeah, that was another thing where I just kind of saw an opportunity and I thought, well, why aren't, like, why aren't we doing this? We should do this. You know, I'm really good at seeing opportunities and I'm not really good at seeing like the barriers to those opportunities. I'm just like, well, we'll figure it out. So I was living in Peru, as I mentioned, in 2013. And my partner who I'd moved there with, our relationship had been kind of on the outs for quite some time. We're, I would say, more like roommates than Mm. actually like a proper partnership. It was about month 18 around in my online business. And, you know, anyone who's done an online business, they know that like that 18 months mark or like two years, you're even working your buns off and like you kind of feel a bit of burnout. 
And a friend of mine that I knew from years and years ago, from all of my travels growing up and everything, contacted me and said, hey, I know you're working for yourself. I know you've got a life coach certification. There's this new company in Antarctica, a polar expedition company that needs someone with your skill set. Would you be keen to come down for six weeks and start up this role? And I was like, oh, I would love a chance to take a break from this computer business, <laughs> from sitting in front mm -hmm. of my laptop and like, you know, coaching people. So I jumped on it and I just told my clients, look, I'm going to be away for six weeks and I'll be back and we'll carry on as we were. And they were all really fine with that, which was great. And I took off and I went and I worked in Antarctica and it was just such a great break from my normal life. I had been there as a passenger before in 2010. So, you know, I already had been to and loved Antarctica and the chance to go back and like get paid to do it. And really, as I say, like take a break from my real life was so appealing. So off I went and did that. And over the course of that six weeks, I realized like, wow, once I leave, because this role didn't exist before I did it, once I leave, they're going to be like screwed for the rest of the season because nobody else can do this role. And so I talked to the president of the company who I reported to directly. And I was like, I kind of think that I should be coming back because what are you going to do when I'm gone? And he was like, oh, good point. Like, can you come back? And I was like, yes, I can because I work for myself. So I make my own rules. So I took a small break over Christmas and then I came back, actually just before Christmas, and then I came back and I ended up staying the rest of the season and in the process met a guy who was one of my colleagues on the ship, a Swedish guy, and we fell in love over the course of that season. I should say that before Christmas, I had already broken up with my partner back home in Peru. So, you know, I wasn't up to any, anything bad in that respect. When I went away from my real life, as I like to say with air quotes, I realized, wow, I like some major changes need to happen. So they happened. And by the end of the season, I had a new boyfriend. And a year later, we were married. So that was an interesting ride. And then that was, yeah. two, this, this, that was a 2014. Yeah, 2015, we got married. And that was also the year that we decided, or I really pushed my husband and his twin brother. Can you imagine two big Swedish dudes, twins? Yeah. Both working as polar expedition leaders. Everybody knows who they are because they're absolutely like the most recognizable dudes in the polar region. And I was like, why don't you have a company? You need to have a company. Like, why are you working for contracts? If you're not on a ship, you're not making any money. That's not good job security. Like, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to do this until you're dead? That's not going to work. And they were like, oh, no, we're not entrepreneurs. We don't do that kind of stuff. And I was like, no, 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 but I am. <laughs> so like, let's join forces, you know? So we did. They're basically the outward facing sales and marketing for our company. And I'm the behind the scenes business person. And that started in 2016. And by 2018, which is about two years ahead of schedule, we started chartering our own vessels and taking people on 12 passenger ships to the Arctic up to see polar bears and that kind of thing. We're an agency and an operator. So we sell trips on bigger ships and we run trips on small ships. And it's been cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Lots of Interesting thing. I'd also like just like to know a bit more about life on Antarctica. So, yeah, I do really like stepping out of kind of what you feel like is reality and just experiencing different realities. Like I went to North Korea and it was actually quite nice to sort of be in somewhere completely different and like not have any of the normal conventions going on. But yeah, what was it like in, so I was worked in an oil rig where it's just complete isolation and it's, it's a very strange place to be. But I imagine, like you said, you got married pretty quickly, but you must have spent so much time with them already because you're basically just living together even if you're not like actually sleeping in the same room kind of thing yeah I i'm saying lots of stuff can you paint the picture for me instead <laughs> yeah 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 for sure yeah yeah antarctica is really unique in that way and even the arctic to a certain degree but especially antarctica because you're so far removed right like in order to get there you have to sail for two days across the drake passage which is one of the most volatile passages of water in the world and then you like come across the continent of Antarctica with these dramatic peaks and snow and penguin colonies everywhere and like whales breaching and icebergs the size of office buildings. And I think what was so amazing for me when I first went down, when my life was kind of in that bit of turmoil, I was burnt out a little bit from my work. I was like not, my partner and I were just not a thing anymore. And I was like, You're living in Peru, like how do you get out of that? Like what's the next steps, you know? And I remember being in Antarctica and just being like, I'm so small. Like, I am such a tiny little speck. Like this world is so huge and Mother Nature is everything. She's so powerful. And I am just nothing. And I don't mean that in a like, I don't matter kind of way. I just mean that it gave me such perspective on my life, on my place in the world. I was like, why am I so stressed out? Like, why not just 
try to do what makes me happy. Right now, I am not happy. How do I move towards more happiness? And, you know, it was a really cool thing as well, being on an expedition ship at that time, because as you say, you know, you are with your colleagues, you're all living together on a ship. We had 100-ish passengers on each trip. Each trip was about 10 days, so we'd rotate a new 100 passengers every 10 days. But the expedition team, which is between 12 to 13 people, was more or less the same people. And so they become your ship family. They become the people that you're like, collaborating with all day, every day. You're working 60 and 17 hour days and relying on each other. And you're in an environment where if something goes wrong, if the weather is bad and you're driving Zodiacs and someone falls out, like you could die. Like there's a real chance of death if you're not cautious and careful and looking out for each other and making sure that the guests are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, I mean, we're all trained, obviously. We have a high level of training for safety. So it's not a real risk in that sense, but things could go wrong. And so when you're working long days in a remote environment where safety is the primary concern and you're trying to keep everyone safe, you're trying to keep each other safe, you really bond quite a bit. And so it was intense. And when I went back to Peru in that little time off in between my first contract and my second contract, I really missed it. Like I really missed the camaraderie. I really missed being out and away from the whole world. You know, Lima has 11 million people in it. And I was like, oh, just take me somewhere quiet. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Antarctica was the I've, best. That's maybe why I like North Korea so much. <laughs> and then, yeah, I definitely get that kind of feelings. And it's just so nice to step out of things with like your, your phone and just like being in cities. So it's just so much, you don't really have time to think about what it is you're doing because you're permanently doing it. It's just so nice to sort of just be like, oh, wait, I'm like this kind of little thing that doesn't really matter. I should think a bit more about what it is I'm doing rather than just constantly doing things. And yeah, it's nice to step out of things. Um, what I was saying, though, yeah. is that, uh, that back in 2013, 2014, when I first started going down to Antarctica, we, in theory, had internet on the ship, but like it never worked. You know, like I said earlier, I'd be up at midnight, like next to the Wi-Fi signal on the bridge trying to send something off to the real world. You know, we didn't we weren't connected. And that was the best, like the absolute best thing ever. These days, the Wi-Fi is actually quite decent. So. You know, I've got colleagues on the ship down there that are sending pictures and video out on Facebook. And I was like, oh, man, seven years ago, you couldn't load Facebook to save your life if you were in Antarctica, you know. So things have changed a lot. It's really nice having the framework for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame. I'd rather go and be off grid. I really would. Having experienced it, I'd rather be off grid any day. Yeah, certainly when you get to like amazing places and there's tourists there that are just constantly like on Instagram and stuff. And like, you're not even like experiencing it because if you're behind the phone the whole time, you're like, (laughs) <laughs> what's the point I think yeah. you just look at these photos anyway and lie <laughs> people are better at taking photos than you are <sighs> yeah that's true yeah nightmare life so we should talk about your book but sounds super cool can you tell me why you started writing it and some of the big lessons yeah sure so I started writing it because I had had a book in me for a long time I knew I wanted to write a book largely because the stories that I used to write on my blog resonated so well with people, but also because over the years of growing my first business and then starting my second business and now in the process of potentially developing a third business, which I can't talk about, but it's exciting if it comes to fruition, I I started calling myself an incurable entrepreneur. You know, I started thinking about like, there's no going back. Like there's no there never was an option to go back into the working world. You know, like I'm out of the matrix. Once I see I've taken the red pill, <laughs> like yeah. I'm done, you know, and this is where I am. And I'm going to keep running these businesses or starting new businesses or helping other people build businesses forever and ever. Amen. Because that's what I love to do. That's my zone of genius. You know, it's really exciting to me. And so we have this term and I think even Brian Clark has a podcast called Unemployable. And I definitely consider myself that. We talked about it earlier. I'm like super employable slash unemployable. But I don't like the negative connotation of unemployable because it mm. sort of says like, I I can't hold a job, let's say, right? And I don't think that that's true at all for most people who are quote unquote unemployable. I think that I prefer the term incurable entrepreneur. Sure, yeah, I, I get to have a job, <laughs> you know, sure, I could like, I could rock it. I could be your whatever, your CEO, but I don't want to be because I need to be out here in this bigger sandbox that I've created making my ideas come to life. That's what fires me up, you know, and then looking at other people's visions and helping them clarify those visions and put the steps in place to bring those to life. That like 
I mean, ooh, I can feel it in my body right now. Just talking about it makes me so happy. And so, yeah, all these things just started to crystallize about a year and a half ago. And I was like, okay, now's the time. I got to sit down and write this book. The title came to me right away, which is, you know, because people always said to me, like, how did you get into this? And I said, well, I left my job. And then I just knew that I was never going back. Plan A is self-determination. I am going to create my livelihood. And there's no plan B. There's no defaulting to a job ever again. And so I called the book No Plan B. It is a how to be an entrepreneur book. It's basically walking people through who you need to become in order to bring to life the things that you want to bring to life. So I talk a lot about the psychology of entrepreneurship, of living, as I call it, outside the matrix. You know, a lot about the psychology of uncertainty and risk and developing your decision-making skills and grappling with fear and uncertainty and dealing with other people's perceptions of you and all that kind of stuff. I really loved writing it. I've actually written it twice. I did a first draft and then I rewrote the entire thing with a developmental editor, which made it 10 times better. And I'm really, really excited to bring it out. Cool. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. All right. All right. Cool. How did you go about finding an editor and like putting the process together of being a, an author exactly? Again, it was personal recommendations because I have a pretty strong entrepreneurial network these days. And so I just went out to people that I really know, like, and trust. And I said, look, I've written this book. I need to work with an editor. Who do I need to talk to? And everybody that I knew screamed one person's name. And I was like, oh, <laughs> guess I better talk to her then. So I spoke with her. Her name is Rachel Allen. If anyone wants to write a book, she's your lady. We had a conversation about my book concept. I sent her my original crappy first draft, as I like to call it. And she was like, this is going to be amazing. We got to bring this to life. And so we spent the next six months going through and rewriting the book. And a developmental editor, for anyone who's listening and doesn't know, is someone who takes your ideas and puts it into a sequence that takes your reader along a journey. So they're mm. basically helping you develop a story and a cohesive narrative that takes the reader on a journey and helps them really get the most value possible out of the stories and the information that you're sharing. And I do have a ton of crazy stories about my life and about the businesses and like massive fails and stuff, you know, because I'm not one of those people who's sitting around there going, oh, look at me, lifestyle entrepreneur, everything's peaches and cream. Like, you know, a lot of stuff happens that's not glamorous at all. There's a lot of days that feel really bad. There's money lost here and there, you know, and I bring all of that out in the book and I talk about the reality of it. In fact, the first third of the book, I'm essentially trying to scare off anyone who isn't the right reader. Mm. I'm like, you know, here's the reality. If this is not you or if you think this sounds terrible, put this book down now and walk away. And if if what I'm writing excites you or if it resonates with you because that's your reality as well, keep on going. It's good to be polarizing and get the right people. Yeah. Nice. So you are self-publishing then? I am self-publishing. Uh -huh. I have a couple of people who really like my work and they're sort of lobbying on my behalf to see if possibly I might be able to get a book deal. So there's a chance that that might change. But the plan right now is to self-publish. Everything I've done, basically working with Rachel, the developmental editor, she is really seasoned in that. And so she has a lot of great contacts. And so when I need, to, for example, a book designer and a line editor, she was like, here are my three best options. I think you should talk to one of them or here's my two best options for this. And so I've just gone through her recommendations and found the ones that I've liked the most. I haven't had to do any of this just completely flying blind on my own. I've leveraged other people's experience and other people's expertise and other people's connections so that I don't have to try to do everything myself. I can just do the thing that I do, which is right, mm -hmm. and then call in the troops to help me get this thing out into the world. If they like well, the main skills required to be a good entrepreneur or being able to build a network and being able to outsource. And I was like, you're great at both of them. <laughs> so well, we haven't actually gone into like, how did you build the network? You just said that you have a great network. That would be quite useful for <laughs> leading into yeah. how you'd be able to have a network, be able to write a book and such. I wish I had an easy answer for that. But to be honest, there wasn't anything in specific that I did other than just be doing this for a long time. I've been now working for myself for nine years and I have done my very best to show up in my work and in my public persona and my private persona with as much integrity as possible. And so that has drawn in a lot of really great people and it's meant a lot of really not so great people have fallen to the wayside. And that's just made my network really, really strong in the process. You know, I've the people in my network are people who 
they like what I have to say. They have recommended clients to come and work with me and those clients have been very happy and vice versa. So it's just being around for a long time, showing up with integrity, doing the things that I say I'm going to do. Many of us feel like we know each other. I mean, you even found me through someone who's in my extended mm. network who I've never met her. I don't really know her. I know of her. But to know that people who are like five degrees away from me are recommending me to other people that, you know, that's nine years of being in the public sphere and saying things that matter, really, you know. And I think the other thing, too, in terms of building a good network is that it's not something that happens by accident. You actually have to show up and like show people that you appreciate them. So when people recommend clients to come and work with me. I send them stuff in the mail, like the person who recommended the other person, you know, like I'll send them like gift in the mail and a card. And I'm like, this means a lot to me. Like your recommendation means I get paid. That's a big deal. And that's your reputation on the line. Because what if I send? I don't take it lightly at all. I make sure that people feel really appreciated because I think that that's really important. And some people, I will actually go out of my way to say, hey, do you want to have like a virtual like coffee on Skype just to catch up? you know, once a quarter or something, because I know that I really like their work. We wouldn't otherwise run into each other because we live in different countries. And I want to, I want them to keep me on their radar and vice versa, you know? So there is some intention there for sure. Good networks don't just happen. And like with the Arctic Expeditions, I guess, who comes on those? They're like rich people, like business people and scientists. Not business people or scientists per se. There are scientists who do polar work, of course. But in the Antarctic, where we do not run our own trips, that's just anybody and everybody. Sometimes it's rich people, but it's a lot of just normal people who really want to get the seventh continent knocked off their list, you know, and someone who has a seven grand to blow, because that's about the cheapest you're going to get it these days. But you'd be surprised. I've traveled with people who are like 20 with their backpack, you know, and they're just like, yeah, I've spent half my money traveling around for six months and the other half is to pay for this. You know, yeah. because like it's yeah. such a big deal to knock off your bucket list. So yeah, you, generally it's a bit older people, a lot of baby boomers, that kind of thing. On our trips in the Arctic, we get definitely a more well-heeled passenger. So usually people 55 to 70 who have some extra cash and they don't want to be on a big ship with a bunch of other people. They want a more bespoke travel experience. Working in that environment has also really helped increase my network. That network is completely different from my business mm. consulting network okay. like they're literally com two completely different worlds yeah, the yeah. Tap world has been so interesting because a lot of the time we get really unique people coming on these ships i mean i traveled a few years ago with one of the two founders of cirque du soleil so i got to travel to antarctica with one of the two founders of cirque du soleil and it was amazing for me as an entrepreneur because I got to sit at a dinner table with this guy and his wife and be like tell me everything how did you start he lived in a hippie commune north of montreal and, you know, didn't even have enough money to like have his own apartment or anything like that. He's like, oh, you know, we were young. We were like street performers. We were roughing a lot of LSD, blah, blah, blah. And then I came up with this idea of like how I could guarantee all of my performing friends some good employment. And that's where it started. That's crazy. Like I get to hear about the beginnings of Cirque du Soleil from the man himself. Mm. So there's, you know, like that kind of stuff. It's just I've met such incredible people over the years. And then, of course, similar to you, we have a podcast for the for the Polar Expedition Company called Antarctic Stories. And I get to interview some of the most amazing people for that. And that further increases my network on the polar side. Because now if someone says, oh, you know, like I want to talk to so or I want to talk to someone who's done X. And I'll be like, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. We had them on the podcast, you know, mm. and the polar world is quite small. So uh, that's been really, really an interesting networking opportunity as well. Yeah, but nice. No, thanks. What's a good advice? You've been like all over the world, living in different places. What made you end up living in Sweden? Because I love Sweden. And this is wondering some of the reasons. Are. Sweden's amazing. And it, I wish I could say that it was like, oh, I'd always dreamed of living in Sweden. But the truth is that I never imagined in a million years that I would live in Sweden. I just didn't, it didn't occur to me. But my husband is Swedish. So when we met and fell in love and got married, it only made sense, especially because we decided it didn't make sense for him to continue working on ships all the time. I have a business to run. Now I have two businesses to run. And I was working on ships to be with him and getting really frustrated because I, you know, I mean, it sounds like a terrible thing to say. I got tired of going to Antarctica because you never tire of going to Antarctica, but I got tired of working on a ship because that's not what I do. I was literally just there so that I could be with him. And I was like, 
I need a home base. I need somewhere, or at least I need to be on dry land with a Wi-Fi connection so that I can actually continue to run my own business and run our business twin tracks. So what can we do here? What's a happy medium? And we decided to settle in Sweden so that he could become a Swedish Coast Guard. So that's his day job. And then he moonlights as a polar expedition leader for our company and also occasionally for other companies. So every now and again, we escape off together and go do a trip in Antarctica or yeah. go on one of our own trips in the Arctic and cool. it's good fun. What are the kind of things that trips that you do then? So the trips that we operate ourselves are right now in Svalbard, which is northern Norway, which is considered one of the best places in the world to see polar bears in the wild. A colleague of ours described it as if you if you can imagine someone chopped off the Swiss Alps, dropped them in the Arctic Ocean and sprinkled polar bears all over them. <laughs> That's pretty much what it's like. So we operate in Svalbard and we, this last season, did our first trip to Greenland. So we're going to branch out and do more of Greenland as well and possibly into Northern Canada. So company's growing. Cool. Nice. I'm, I'm super excited for my trip to Svalbard. Just looming. Just one of the other reasons why I think I got put in touch with you is someone said that they knew someone that knew something about Svalbard. Anyway, what is the kindest thing that someone has done for you? Oh, the kindest thing that someone has done for me. I don't think that this gentleman realized it, but when I was just finishing the in-person portion of my coach's training, there was another man that was in my class. There was probably like 20 of us, something like that. And he was just another guy who was taking the same coach's training as me. And I was like, what was I then? 30, what, 32? And he was probably in his late 30s, early 40s. And he had no way of knowing this, but I, I had a really bad upbringing. And at that point, I had been estranged from my father for many, many, many years. And in my upbringing, my father had been really, really emotionally abusive and made us, well, I have two sisters, and he had made the three of us just feel like absolute nothing, you know, like absolute dirt. And this man, this sweet man who like, I don't even remember his name. At the end of our long weekend together of this intensive coaches training, he came up to me and he's like, how we don't find this weird? But I just wanted to tell you that you are one of the most creative and inspiring young women I've ever met. And if my daughters grow up to be half of the woman that you are, I will be the proudest father. And like, even though I feel so emotional saying that, I almost burst into tears standing in front of him because I, that, the kindness of him saying that to me, I mean, he could have just kept it inside, but he decided to tell me and the kindness of him to think to tell me that. I'm not even kidding. It healed like years and years and years of like crap and trauma. Yeah. You know? Wow. Yeah. It's yeah. a nice thing. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's really funny. Like how some of these things can make such a big difference. Although just to like slightly poo on your moment a bit, did you like then tell him that he should have be- abused his kids to make them like interesting <laughs> and be like more like you? Because Ed, it's a funny <laughs> one. Yeah, Totally. It's like, well, don't be too nice to them because then they'll be boring when they grow up. Yeah, I mean, you come across like quite a nice person. You're probably going to have terrible children. Like this. Yeah. yeah, totally. It's funny how it works that way. <laughs> yeah, it's an awkward one about how to bring up your kids, really, isn't it? Yeah, and now I'm like, oh, how do we create the best humans? <laughs> yeah, he knows. I mean, like Elon Musk didn't have the best childhood. He's doing all right. Yeah, that's true. Is there anything you'd like to say as a useful take home? I suppose to anyone listening, what I really want everybody and anybody to know and to consider is that if you feel like you have unlived life in you don't stop don't let that just simmer you know i mean it is such a true thing that every day that goes by is a day that you don't get back you know you have this one sweet life and if you're just biding time if you're just saying like maybe later when i'm more ready or i'm more this or i'm more that like don't let that keep you in stasis, you know, like don't let that unlived life hide away because life is so amazing. And the only thing between you and like the great things that you could do, even if they're not anything, you know, massive, like maybe you just have never been on an airplane before and like you're 41 like me and maybe you've been thinking about get get on the airplane. You know, it doesn't need to be massive things. You don't need to create businesses. Just like Do those things that you've been longing for because you don't know if tomorrow that chance is going to be taken away from you. Well, thank you so much for Heather coming on the show. There was so much dense, meaty topics to break into there and to learn from. 
She is truly an example of how we can overcome trauma and emotion from our past and take responsibility for our lives and the best life that we can live now. Above all, I think what I learned from her was the importance of just pursuing unconventional paths to whatever definition of success that suits you. Just to break free from the societal norms and expectations and just pursue a life filled with authenticity and adventure on your terms. Heather underscored the importance of just taking more risks, facing uncertainties, just because in order to live a life that's rich and interesting, you just has to be filled with some risks and uncertainties rather than letting these opportunities pass us by. Now, if this episode helped you see some of the importance of seizing the moment, then feel free to passionately grab your phone and share this episode with anybody you think needs to hear this or to leave us a ravingly good review about how amazing this podcast is and that you wish you'd been listening to this podcast since you were born because it's just so good. Okay, I've maybe gone too far. But anyway, if you liked it, it would be nice if you showed it. Thanks for listening. As always, life is to be enjoyed. That starts with enjoying today. Loving your life is not something to do in the future. It's something to do now. So be kind to yourself and whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too.